Hello, um, yeah, my name is Chunyok Chok from the Seoul National University Law School. I'm, I'm very happy and honored that uh, we are hosting uh, this So I understand that the, the role of the chair is uh, keeping on time. And I'm very happy that we have lunch after this session. So I think all presentators and this concerned are all aligned to finish timely. And uh, I, I want to call it the ecosystem of timely presentation, but maybe Oliver, Jennifer, and team uh, would uh, be a much better position to name it. So, uh, Charles, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the conference organizers for uh, including our paper in this stellar program. Um, so, um, this paper, if you had a chance to uh, look at it, um, you might have seen that there's like more than the average setup cost just to get into the tables. Um, so I hope you'll be a little bit patient with me uh, this morning. Um, I thought I might just start out at the 10,000 foot level to give you a sense of where we're going and how this differs from the kind of traditional uh, governance work that you might be used to reading. So in some of my prior work, I've asked questions like, do governance structures matter, and if so, how? And empirical work in this area typically tries to leverage the variation uh, uh, in the balance of power or control between corporate managers and uh, minority investors and relate that variation to uh, outcomes like performance or value. We're going to take a slight pivot from this kind of more kind of classical question and ask whether or not the transparency about governance structures can matter, and if so, how. Very approximately, empirically, what we're going to try and do is to fix the balance of power control and then leverage the variation in the transparency with which you can observe uh, um, uh, ownership and control, or the incentive structure for managers, and then relate that variation to outcomes like our value. Okay. Now, you might be wondering, well, why are you asking this question? Um, it turns out one important piece of due diligence you'd like to do if you're an investor is to, before allocating capital, is to better understand what are the manager's incentives? Or if there's a controller, what are her incentives? This kind of due diligence can be particularly important if you're thinking about investing in interactional contexts, especially uh, where there's weaker institutions of governance. So put it bluntly, what you'd like to find out if you're an investor is what kinds of ripoff incentives am I potentially facing? Okay? If I were to allocate capital, how likely is it am I going to get expropriated? Um, now, while this could be important, it's not always easy to do, uh, perform this kind of due diligence because of the various sources of informational opacity that you might face in these kinds of investment contexts. And it turns out one of those sources of information opacity can arise as a result of complexity of ownership structure. So let me explain. When we're thinking about this kind of uh, investment context, we're thinking about international firms, many of which often belong to business groups. We know uh, by one estimate, 40% um, of listed groups uh, around the world belong to a business, uh, business group. Now, one of the key features of business groups is the presence of a controller who can often wield a degree of control over business group firms that can greatly exceed their economic ownership. That means that there's often a wedge, a separation, between their voting rights in companies and their cash flow rights. And this wedge is often created, maintained, and enhanced through various types of control-enhancing structures. Around the world, we know of three common types, stock pyramids, cross-share holdings that involve ownership groups, which I'll explain in just one slide, and uh, weighted voting rights like dual class shares. Now, the presence of this incentive wedge means that incentive conflicts vis-a-vis -vis minority shareholders can be quite common. Okay? But the ease with which you can observe, scrutinize, compare controllers' incentive conflicts across group firms can critically depend on the kinds of control-enhancing structures in place. And this was an observation that, um, at least, uh, went as far back as Betcha, Crackman, and Trientes in their 2000 paper. What they show is that with pyramids and circular shareholdings, you can produce economically very similar outcomes in terms of facilitating control 
with little direct ownership. The one difference they point out is that circular shareholdings make true ownership or the locus of control uh, much more opaque, opaque. So what we're interested in this paper is to really try to understand to what extent making it easier to be uh, to scrutinize, understand, compare the degree of incentive conflicts um, of the corporate controllers across group firms, whether or not that matters for valuation. And what we'll do uh, at the end of the day is approximately compare how firm value evolves when business group firms are held in these relatively opaque circular shareholding structures to a relatively transparent holding company pyramid-like structure. Okay. So I've been talking about circular shareholdings. Um, let me give you some intuition as to why they operate to enhance control, but also introduce opacity to the equation. Okay. I'll just begin with uh, the stylized example of a small business group firm, a uh, small business group involving four companies, A, B, C, and D. So here the family sits at the top. The arrows indicate the direction of ownership. And for simplicity, let's just assume that if an entity owns 50% or more of the shares in a company, it effectively controls that firm's decision as well as uh, the shares that that company holds in others. Okay. So in this example, whoops, in this example, uh, how do I get the, okay, in this example, the family controls A, and it also controls the 40% that A holds in C, which by the way means that the family doesn't control C, and it doesn't control B, it doesn't control D. Family controls only A in this particular example. Now, if you're an investor, trying to do due diligence in this business group, what you'd be interested in knowing is in which of these firms does the family have uh, good incentives and in which of these firms does the family have relatively poor incentives. Now, one way you can operationalize that is to figure out what the family's cash flow and voting rights are in each of the group firms. Figure out what that incentive wedge is and compare that wedge across the group firms. So, in this particular example, that exercise is quite easy. Why? Because all you have to do is to follow the ownership chain. So family here, if you look at firm A, has 50% cash flow and voting rights. There's zero wedge. Incentives are relatively good. Well, what about firm C? I just told you that because family controls A, it also has the 40% voting rights in C. What about cash flow rights? Well, cash flow rights, all you have to do here is to multiply these percentages along the ownership chains, going from the family to firm C. So you've got 20% along this chain, and then you've got another about 4% along this chain. So cash flow rights, 24%. Voting rights, 40%. You've got a wedge of 16%. And then we can deduce that the family probably has better incentives in firm A than it does in firm C. So where's the loop? There's no, there's no circularity here. So where does that come from? What the family would really like to do here is to control not just one of the four companies in the business group. What it would like to do, ideally, is to control all of the group firms. In particular, it would like to do so without having to plunk down a chunk of additional capital, because that's always an option, but it's a costly option. So how can it do that? Turns out. One easy way to do this is for the family to simply get firm C to invest in a stake in B, creating this circular ownership loop, and the family would have effective control over everyone. Okay? I'm going to give you a very approximate intuition for how this might work. And for those who know this stuff well, I know this is not technically quite accurate, but you know, resist your allergic reaction. Um, okay, so Family has control over A. So imagine A has slack capital. So it tells A to increase its holdings in C from 40 to 50%. Now it controls C. Then you can get C to invest in an additional stake. But because family controls C, it controls this 30% in B, which added to the 25% it already has, the family now controls B, B controls B, family controls everyone. And in addition, 
because the family now has so much ownership of C, you can actually reduce this number back down to 40%. You preserve control. The family hasn't plunked down any additional capital. This is the outcome that the family would like. Okay? Now, if you're an investor who's interested in doing due diligence in this business group structure, now the exercise is a lot more costly or a lot more complicated. Why? Imagine you're trying to figure out, say, cash flow rights uh, in firm B. Well, when B pays out dividends, where does it go? Well, some of that goes to B, sorry, some of that goes to C, then some of that goes to D, some of that circulates back to B. So B is a claimant on its own cash flows an infinite amount of times. Now, you can't think about this stuff too much <laughs> because your mind starts to melt. <laughs> I, I see you. I don't know if your mind's melting right now. Um, it turns out what you have to do is to basically set up a system of simultaneous equations, solve it, and then you kind of figure out who's got what effective cash flow rights in each of the group firms. Okay? To figure out control, you have to do something like a system of equations, not quite, but the main point is this is uh, quite a bit more complicated and costly. If you were to solve those simultaneous equations, as we do here in this example and also in the paper, what you find, in fact, is that there's a wide variation in the controller's conflict of interest across the different group firms as proxied by this incentive wedge. Main point in this example is that in the presence of this circular loop in the ownership structure, it's not so easy for minority investors to figure out where they're more likely to suffer or benefit from expropriation. Now imagine this alternative, a holding company structure, a pyramid-like holding company structure. I hope it's intuitive just by virtue of visual inspection that this would be much easier to do due diligence on. If you cared about cash flow rights and voting rights, just like the first example, all you have to do is to follow the ownership chain. Okay? What we'll do in the paper in studying the effects of transparency on firm value is uh, basically studying how value evolves when you go from a structure like this to a structure like this. Okay. And the way we're going to try and study uh, this question is to take advantage or to really hone in on the South Korean setting, which is very attractive to us for at least two reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is got, that it's got the variation of interest. Okay. For the last um, decade plus, um, Korean business group firms, the so-called chebels, have been undergoing this massive transformation in ownership structure from a uh, circular shareholding structure to a holding company structure, this pyramid-like structure. Historically, circular shareholdings have been relied upon by chebels to help them grow and diversify while maintaining control over group firms. But after the 97 Asian financial crisis, uh, the Korean regulators began this long-standing effort to reform the channels, um, and what it would like to do is to improve the transparency of these uh, uh, controlling structures, governance transparency. In their view, circular shareholdings not only uh, enable excessive control over group firms, but also lower the transparency of the governance structure. They believe that uh, the transformation to this holding company structure would, at minimum, improve the transparency. Okay. The other reason why this is a really nice setting and why I'm sure you know, this is a group of folks among whom there's uh, many business group uh, scholars, Korea is really um, an attractive setting if you're interested in business groups, in part because of the availability of data. The Korean uh, uh, Free Trade uh, Commission collects ownership data for uh, all group firms in each uh, large chebel. Um, and at least since 2007, this is uh, made publicly available online. We're going to analyze essentially the post-2011 period um, in our analysis because this is a period in which there is standardized financial reporting in IFRS. And also, this is a period in which the vast majority of the transitions uh, took place. So let me show you an actual example of a transition 
This is Latte Group in 2016, before the transformation. This is actually a small snippet of the overall group. But I hope that um, you can see how complicated it is already when you look at a small snippet. There's like many loops here. There's another one of those things that you don't want to look at too much. But actually, this is closer <laughs> to the reality of what the group looks like. Okay? After the transformation, hopefully again, just by pure visual inspection, you'll agree that this is far more transparent and probably easier to scrutinize. Okay? Now, when we look at the summary statistics over our sample period, what we see is that there's indeed been a uh, massive transformation, a huge success in the simplification of business group structures. Okay? We looked at the proportion of firms that listed firms that belong to these complicated ownership loops. In the beginning of the period, about 30% of listed firms were belong to a loop. And by the end of our sample period, that number is now down to 5%. So this is an 80% proportional decline. Okay. What's really interesting to us is that when you look at everything else, um, the percentage of firms under the family's control didn't change. It was 60% at the beginning of the period, 60% at the end of the period. And this is basically the Chuck Kraft and Trientis result. Pyramids, cross shareholdings can produce effectively the same outcome of maintaining control with little direct investment. When we look at, this is, a, we call it separation, but this is the incentive wedge. When we look at the average incentive wedge, the average level of direct ownership also fairly flat over this period. <coughs> so to us, that at least suggests the possibility that there could be um, a transparency or revelation effect uh, that could be interesting here, and that's what we're after. So what's the prediction? Um, in the appendix, we basically um, show comparative uh, statics uh, uh, using uh, essentially a classic information economics model, Fisher and Varechia 2000. But I'll do a simplified version of this to give you some intuition for what's going on. Imagine that the valuation model the market uses is something like take a price earnings multiple and then multiply your long run earnings estimate to it to get the price, to get value. Okay. What the model basically shows is that when you have a revelation about managerial incentives or controller incentives in this case, <coughs> there could be two effects coming through these two channels. The first channel is what we call the earnings informativeness channel. And what it says is that once you have a better sense of incentives, investors now get a better handle on long-term earnings and leading them to apply a higher valuation multiple on each dollar of their long-term expected earnings. Okay? So this channel generally increases uh, a stock price. Okay? But there's a second channel, which we call the expected incentives channel, in which revelation can lead markets to update their priors about firms' incentive conflicts, and therefore your long-term expected earnings. Okay? And this can move prices in ambiguous ways. If incentives turn out to be better than the market had originally expected, okay, the market will revise their long-term earnings estimates upwards, that would reinforce this earnings informativeness effect, pushing prices up. But if the controller's incentives turn out to be worse than the market had initially expected, they would downward revise long-term earnings okay, that would counteract this first channel. And then you can get either a smaller positive effect, no effect, or even a negative effect on value. Okay. And our empirical results basically show both of these channels at play. Okay. Our prediction here is that the transparency effects on value should really be concentrated in those group firms where there's a greater degree of ex ante incentive uncertainty. And we think this means where the ownership structure is particularly difficult to observe. Okay? So we're going to use two ways of proxying for this. One is if you're really deep down in the group structure. And then the other is if um, the controllers, if the family has no direct ownership. Okay. That's one of the, when we talk to investors, that's one of the proxies they say they use to try to understand which firms have good incentives. Well, if the family directly owns a lot of shares, they probably have reasonably good incentives. But there's 
If the medium firm, the family has 0% ownership. Okay. So among this group of firms, our predictions are, to test the first channel, we can look at whether or not earnings response coefficients, okay, how market prices react to earnings, um, they should improve after group simplification. The second channel is somewhat hard to test because we can't observe market expectations. So we have an indirect way of testing for this, uh, which is to directly look at value. Because our predictions say that there should be a positive value effect in those firms where controllers actually have relatively good incentives. Okay, this is the upward revision of earnings that should reinforce the ERC effect. So we should get um, po a positive value effect. But where there's uh, the controller has relatively poor incentives, we should get no effect or potentially even a negative value effect. And this is exactly what we find in the data. We have another more direct test of the second channel, which is to use long run consensus or three year ahead consensus analyst earnings uh, estimates as an approximation for um, the market earnings estimates. Um, this is more direct, but the data is more limited as well. And we find some evidence consistent with, uh, with our transparency theory. In executing our tests, we're mostly actually going to focus on the non-loop firms. Okay. And the reason for doing so is that we think this is a potentially cleaner subsample to test the transparency effects, because the loop firms, um, when you transition to a holding company structure, it often involves loop firms going through complicated M&A transactions, which might mean that any value effects you capture in loop firms are likely, um, could potentially come from uh, if, uh, you know, sources unrelated to transparency. Okay. Loop firms also tend to differ substantially in characteristics. Uh, they tend to be bigger, older, uh, more central to the business group. Okay. So basically, um, this is an expanded version of a former picture I showed you. We're, kind of, we're going to be looking at these kinds of companies. Okay? They're all shoots of the loop and looking at how their values and how their earnings response coefficients are changing as they go from this to this. Okay? Um, just very quickly, ERCs, overall we see earnings responses increase after group simplification. Okay? We capture simplification by looking at the fraction of the group firms that, have, that were removed from loops. But this effect is all concentrated in the low observability firms, exactly as we might expect. Okay. Overall, we find no value effects associated with um, our group simplification. But that's because we have two offsetting, uh, basically two subgroups, where the effects are going in opposite directions. In firms where the controller has relatively good incentives, we see this positive effect. And then we capture a slightly negative uh, effect here in those non-loop firms where the controllers have relatively poor incentives. Okay, so this is consistent with the idea that markets are kind of revising their long-term earnings estimates downwards, and that's offsetting the positive effect from the ERC channel. Okay. Um, you're about to see a presentation in a few minutes saying never trust any paper that has a Q regression. <laughs> and so, but I'm hoping Pedro is going to uh, save the Q regression enterprise. <laughs> but because I saw this paper last week at Leah, we've been working hard. Uh, so we get, we get results and returns. So you don't have to trash my paper later. At least not for this reason. You can trash it for other reasons. Um, OK. So uh, long-term expectations uh, are direct tests here. It's a bit weaker. This is probably the weakest result in the paper. Um, but this is what we have. Um, and then we ran a bunch of robustness tests, basically trying to rule out the idea that these kind of differential value effects that we're capturing are driven by real changes. We, of course, can't rule out. We know that real changes have to occur uh, in particular firms. But all we show here is that Real changes like uh, changes in incentive conflicts, the degree of control, the degree of expropriation, uh, that doesn't seem to be systematically explaining why we're getting these offsetting value effects. Okay? So I think um, our main insight here is that transparency, 
uh, could have ambiguous effects on value precisely because of these two off, uh, potentially offsetting channels. <coughs> Thank you and look forward to your discussion. for the organizers for inviting me to this early stage. This is very interesting. Uh, because, and I was uh, very much flattered that uh, overseas investors would uh, look so much into detail about the Korean corporate structure, especially the business group structure, and in taking advantage of our, of our uh, data set. Uh, so just to uh, summarize, so this is an empirical paper that examines the relationship between the removal of the loose structure and clean variables. This is basically their X variable, explanatory variable, which they use, uh, uh, they use a uh, dummy variable to the, uh, I'm sorry, a continuous variable at the group level. And then what would happen to the valuation of non-loose firms? Uh, And the main finding is that if you remove all oh, this loose structure, then it's associated with, first, positive relationship between SUE and uh, punitive annual return. And then here is, it gets a little complicated with the cross-section variation and everything. So you get larger Q in low-wage firms or smaller Q in high-wage firms for non loop firms, but not for all non loop firms. There's also additional cross-section variation, but only for lower uh, 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 firms that are lower in the group or that have high position value or low direct ownership firms. So their second main result relies on a lot of cross-section variation. And their interpretation is that improved transparency may improve earnings informativeness from the first result and uh, but it depends on the degree of relative agent problem uh, within the group and uh, information transparency overall. So uh, I, I like it very much. Uh, we know this phenomenon uh, very well in Korea, but uh, not many uh, foreign scholars are uh, familiar with this. But you kind of look at it from a different angle, from information transparency. And if any of our regulators were here from KFPC, they would very much like your paper because this is what they intended. Okay? So basically their policy aim was to sort of remove this loop structure and make it more transparent uh, uh, to a more pyramidal holding company structure. But I have uh, more questions than answers uh, by looking at this paper. Okay, so uh, big picture issues. The first uh, issue I had was what is your unconditional effect of SUE on your cumulative abnormal return? So this is a typical uh, accounting paper that looks at the relationship between standardized uh, unexpected earnings and uh, returns, national returns. So any paper, you first show that SUE has some effect on your cumulative abnormal return. This is the baseline, okay? And then if you interact it with size, and you get some additional effect, or some offsetting effect, or so on, okay? So this is the basic setup, and this is their first main table, and for the unconditional effect, I don't have any results. So uh, I have uh, some uh, issues on how I should interpret the, uh, their additional results focusing on this, because we don't have the baseline result. So if there is no baseline result, what is uh, the relationship between SUE and, and, and the cumulative abnormal return in Korea? So this is my first issue. And the second issue is it's, it's a more uh, 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 serious in the sense that uh, the authors emphasize this removal of non-loop is a, a very meaningful uh, uh, phenomenon in Korea. But I'm wondering, what is the actual distribution of your X variable, and also your Y variable? How representative is this removal of firms from loops among the general uh, uh, business group firms? Okay. So this X variable is defined as a group year level variable, fractional group firms that had loops removed in a given year. Okay. 
Okay? So for prawns that did not have any loop in the first place, this is all zero. Okay? So you're only focusing on a, a, a group prawns that had removal in that specific year. Okay? How many of them do we actually have? So if you actually look at the distribution, this removal fraction is zero for a vast majority of the sample, and for 75 uh, percentile, uh, it's still zero. And if you go to 70, uh, 96 percentile now, it's 0 0.1. Okay, so how many vari how much variation do we have in this removal fraction? I'm a bit uh, 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 concerned about this representativeness of this removal firms. So I did a, a little bit of a further research on this, right? And then if you actually look at the number of business groups that had loops in 2011, which is the start of their uh, sample period, there were 13 groups. And these are uh, uh, as uh, uh, well, presented by KFTC. Now, if you go down to 2018, there are only six groups with loops. So, so in terms of number of groups, we had a substantial uh, number of groups that I actually had removed these loops <coughs> during the, uh, their sample period, so that's good. Which means the difference are uh, the number of groups that got rid of these loops. So the difference is actually one number smaller than the difference of this because Tongyang was they exited the KFTC regulation. So, so these are the ones that are actually had loops at the beginning of their sample period, but had removed loops. Okay. So Lotte is the prominent example, and we have some of the other uh, smaller business groups here. This is what they, okay, so, uh, so I fully agree with the authors for Lotte specifically, very okay. I wouldn't dare calculate their cash flow, even control rights looking at this, this diagram, it's just too complex. So this, I agree. Now, if you look at this number of firms in the loop, the, the red ones are the ones that are actually in the loop, and then the blue ones, uh, are the ones that are outside of the loop. So what they're actually doing is, okay, so if you remove this loop structure, what would happen to the variations of the blue firm? That's basically their empirical set, okay? So now I'm looking at some of the other business groups that remove their loops, okay? So this is uh, Hanjin, right? Uh, and then this is their loop structure, much more simplified than before. So here, these red ones are that are in the loops. And then the blue ones are those that are not in the loops. Now, I'm concerned that how difficult it is for the investors to calculate cash flow rights in these loop firms. Because I had my undergrad students calculate these uh, 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 measures for these uh, groups. Because, well, I, I mean, it's indeed true that you have infinite amount of loops. That's true. But you actually have to solve a simultaneous equation. Why? Because if the infinite number of loops, as you increase that, that additional term, that converts it to zero because it's 0.5 multiplied by 0.4 and so on. So students would ask me, at what point do I, so up until when do I have to keep the doing on this loop? And I say, just, you know, do an arbitrary cutoff. As it becomes smaller than 0.1%, you should stop. Okay, and then you can calculate this. So, I mean, it, it would not be that difficult to do this. So. How opaque is the structure compared to after removing the structure in terms of improving informational efficiency? Here's another example that's even simpler, okay, which also had a loop. Okay? So this is a one publicly traded firm that was in the loop, and these three are non-loop firms that should be affected by removal of loops. And the only loop that we have here is this link. Okay? So what kind of, uh, 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 how much of marginal information transparency do we achieve from this removal? I don't know if it's skeptical. Okay. And in also in terms of number of firms that are being affected, I just showed you four, uh, three cases here. How many, I'm sorry. Uh, so how many non-new publicly traded firms are involved? So there were four. Right, in Lotte, which is most complex. Indeed, Lotte is most complex. So for Lotte, I kind of agree with, with, your, uh, with your argument. But for the other firms here, how many uh, publicly traded firms? Two. Non-loop firms. How many publicly traded non-loop firms? Three. 
So, I mean, we're talking, and then how many business models? We're talking eight. So, the number of non moot problems that you examine, right? I mean, you know, it's like a couple of maybe 20, 30 that we're looking at per year. I mean, I mean this is for that single year, right? So, because uh, your x variable will become zero the next year. So that's uh, one of my main concerns. And then, uh, so, so this is related with this small number of observations. And then you try to tease out more from the further cross-sectional variation in these already smaller number of firms, right? So you separate high versus low uh, wedge firms, which is possible for incentive conflict gradient problem, which is okay in the literature. But in the Korean context, this, this will go back to my Oh. My last comment as well, but what we feel in Korea is that if you're a member of a group which is tightly defined by KFTC, you have full control, basically. So, so, so you, in your example, you show that the families did not control these firms and after 50% you full control, I do not agree. So it's regardless of the percentage of ownership, if KFTC defines you're a member of the group, then they did all this you know, detail, okay, you're a member of the group, and then the control exercise full control. That is precisely the reason why that firm is in the group in the first place. Okay? So then, I would actually, in the Korean context, this was a policy issue, actually. Should we use the wedge, or should we just use the cash flow rights? Because the level of control is the same. It's 100%, literally. So you just look at how small of a cash flow right do you have in this uh, 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 this, uh, this company as a main, uh, so maybe you should just perhaps use this ultimate ownership as the main agency uh, uh, variable. And even within this high and low wedge firm, you further separate, uh, <laughs> there's an additional layer of, second layer of cross-sectional variation. And now, I, I, I'm, <laughs> this is my concern. You, maybe you're trying to tease out too much from already a, a small sample, right? And of course, these are also correlated as well, and that's another uh, issue. So this is another uh, example of the ones that remove the loop. Red ones are in the loop, blue ones are not in the loop. So these are the ones uh, that is higher in the group with high direct ownership and low separation. These are the ones in the lower, uh, lower in the group, low direct ownership and high separation, and then you're trying to make a comparison between these two. Oh, so that's, okay. <laughs> I have a bigger picture. So this is not directly related with your paper, but this is uh, uh, about, uh, about concerns that we have as academics, and academics who support regulators in terms of this business group structures, but bigger uh, uh, picture problems. Now, you focus on non loop firms from academic perspective for, for in terms of clarity, that's fine. But for us, I mean, we're interested in loop firms as well because we have this, so this is what you show in your paper, right? What we have to uh, uh, understand from this transition is that we now have an additional publicly traded firm. Here, they used to have four publicly traded firms when you're transferring this to this, we have another additional publicly traded firm, which is this holding company, right? And what, uh, so, so here it is, uh, 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 your data set. What is the valuation consequences for this additional publicly traded company? And this is, because this is the holding company and it's publicly traded. And this is a key regulatory issue and also uh, uh, investors' interest and so on. Now, I have a bunch of holding companies. So here, this is the business group, this is the holding company, this is the number of public subsidiaries, and this is the uh, market cap of the publicly traded holding company, and this is the value of publicly subsidiary shares. Now, if there's no, uh, if there's no arbitrage, of course A should be bigger than B, right? Because you can buy out all the shares in B and sell off the shares in the subsidiary. In Korea, we have 80 cases that's exactly the opposite. And then we have all the famous companies that you know of in this list where Samsung, so where's all these SKs? So here we have Samsung and Samsung CNT is the only company. They have shares in Samsung Electronics and so on. And if you look at the market cap, it's well below, well below 
So right over there are subsidiaries, and if you divide this by this, it's like 0 0.4. I'm actually working on a paper on this. So this is not short sales constraints, but long purchase constraint. Uh, why can you buy this? Because you cannot just you can't you cannot simply buy Samsung TNT because it's held tightly held by the family and you cannot sell them. So you can't do the arbitrage. This cannot exist in the US. But we have and then where's Lotte? So here's Lotte. So Lotte is here. So Lotte uh, company, the holding company itself is also severely undervalued. So if you look at the ratio between this and this, and then we still have an issue. So is it enough to only to look at nominal firms? I, mean, I have a concern. My final, why are they trying to uh, transition to this structure? To uh, transparency, I mean, as the government says, that's what I used to think, but if you do, I, my earlier papers were like that. My earlier papers were like that, but after I got to know the actual mechanism in how they transition into this, you kind of figure out why and how they do this. The way they do it is they first do a spin-off like this, like in US. So if you just look at this stage, right, they don't have any uh, 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 equity ownership structure uh, between, so they should be completely independent firms like in US. But here, it doesn't stop here. In Korea, what happens is that the holding company would do a tender offer to, for the shareholders of operating company asking, okay, give me a shares in operating company. I will issue new shares of the holding company and give it to you. Who would uh, uh, participate in this tender? The families or the retails? Only the families. The retails, they don't move. So what happens in the second stage is that this arrow, goes over here, and then this, because they don't participate, they become thinner, and because only they tender, and then they get new shares, their ownership becomes more, more thicker. And then this is how it looks like. You effectively created another pyramid. Okay, and then why do they do this? Why do they do this? So uh, uh, most minorities, they already know that minorities won't tender, uh, so they do this. And then, as, as a result, families always almost double. And why do they do this? This is almost always related to succession. Okay. And why do they do this? Because inheritance tax in Korea is so high. It's 50 to 60 percent, right? So if you pay inheritance tax, you cannot maintain control over this company. And then if you do this, right, you have 25 percent over here, and then now you have 50 percent over there. You pay half of that as your inheritance tax. You're done. Okay. And this is why they actually change into this structure. So this holding company uh, 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 regulation, deregulation in Korea, we generally think this is not having been a success. Okay, so I have some of the remaining comments, but uh, interesting in the interest of time. So let me conclude here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for an excellent discussion. Um, I'll just uh, tackle a couple of points. On the, you know, we had looked at those um, number of loop firms at the KFTC. Um, we were always puzzled by that because we have a lot more in our day. Not um, we have like twenty plus business groups with with loops, so we could never reconcile our numbers with the KFTC. So we still don't understand what's going on. Um, on the our original paper actually included all the loop firms. And precisely because we thought um, we, we wanted bigger samples to, to help us do our tests. And the problem we <laughs> continue to run into was that people got really stuck with the loop firm analysis because we can also show the ERC effects, the uh, earnings revision effects in the loop firms as well. But we have to go through a lot of trouble to try to say, look, at least these effects don't seem to be fully driven by some of, you know, totally agree on, hey, there are other things going on here. There could be value transfer because we're planning for inheritance uh, uh, tax. And so we know the, the CHIL and CNT as, as a salient example there. And so people got really stuck there. And so we just decided maybe for academic purposes, it might be easier to move it. And now we're contemplating a possibility of just lumping everything together. So at a minimum, we can, we can have a, a larger sample. Um, the unconditional effect on SUE, this is also something that we had looked at. Um, to be honest, we don't 
quite understand why in our sample uh, we don't get those main effects, but um, something uh, for us to dig into some more. Um, and I would say we have also grappled with, uh, well, why can't people do this? Yeah, it's a system of simultaneous equations, but also not that hard. But uh, you know, we didn't talk to, of course, every investor, but there's no investor we talked to that said, oh yeah, this is what, what we do. And so I guess all we really need is this introduces some amount of like, non-trivial cost to their degree of due diligence. That's all we need for our story, I think. Um, and finally, on the wedge point, fully agree, we don't really have to take the control measure very seriously, and we have tried a version which is just look at ultimate ownership. Um, and all we need to rely on is the idea that the variation in the wedge is associated with um, outcomes of, of, of bad incentives, and there's, you know, you know better than me that there's plenty of papers that show this. Higher wedge in Korean companies are associated with um, higher likelihood of tunneling, um, um, earnings management, and so on. Um, so I think those are the points that come to mind, but thank you for a very detailed and uh, excellent discussion. Okay, uh, th this is a very interesting paper and a very informative discussion with it. And uh, I've been wondering th how this relates to uh, cross shareholding in Japan, which has, uh, as you know, a large literature which goes back to a uh, long, long time ago. And I, I thought a couple of things can be related to uh, discussion here. One is that there's old discussion in Japanese cross holdings that this goes back to 1980s. And uh, people find out you know, the, the, when, when you have a loop uh, that uh, mechanically increases the PE ratio. So they've been doing this uh, calculation, or the researchers uh, have been doing this, or well, used to do this uh, calculation uh, with uh, infinite, uh, infinite iteration. And uh, that was possible even then, 30 years ago, with a limited uh, computer power. Uh, I did something similar that to uh, Japanese Keiretsu 30 years ago. It, it took me like overnight using my PC, but now yeah, I think you can do that with nanoseconds. So that relates to how opaque it is. is uh, I agree with that. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there may be uh, some, something related to that literature even though that literature went away after the Japanese startup did collapse. But probably more relevant is that there has been a discussion in Japan on the issue of a parent subsidy. The, both of those firms are listed in the, um, in, in the market, and the, some, some of the people here may know much better. But the, there have been uh, attempts to uh, arbitrage because uh, you may not be able to buy up the subsidies of Samsung, but for smaller firms in Japan, uh, they can do that. So, so some people tried, and uh, corporations started to react by uh, absorbing um, the subsidiaries into, or making the subsidiary 100% subsidiary, and uh, delist the subsidiary. So this is, uh, in a sense, um, attempt to increase the transparency in a Different ways as Korea happened. It happened in Korea. In Korea, there's additional companies created, holding company, as you said. But if you delist a subsidiary in the chain and eliminate the loop, you have one less company. So it will be interesting to see if the implication was different between Japan and Korea. And you, you may not want to do this in the same paper. Uh, talking about Japan and Korea in the same paper is not a good idea. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you can do this with uh, some other yeah, we, we have only uh, 10 minutes left, so we can end it short term. Charlie, can you help me understand the starting point here? There are some firms that are being held in a circular structure, but the way you told the, the, way you told the story, the switch from the circular structure to the holding company structure doesn't materially affect how much capital you need to invest to preserve control. But in the status quo, the some firms are being harmed by the opacity, whereas some other firms are benefiting from being lumped together with the firms with a lower wedge. Why is it that the firms with a lower wedge do not, in the ex-ante position, reveal their position by being more transparent, even 
by directly switching into a holding company structure or by somehow alternatively uh, disclosing what their wages in a way that would enable market participants to separate them from the, the bad apples in, in the basket. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Charles, for your wonderful presentation. I'm really interested in that your feedback and also a very good comment on it. And uh, actually, I published a paper in Korean last week, or last week uh, about the KFTC, the con controlling shareholder regulation. And, uh, uh, also, I published a, uh, in English a paper about the, the corporate government, uh, the corporate groups uh, in uh, Korea. And, uh, I mean, as a, uh, as a because Kim mentioned, I mean, holding company discount is uh, one of the uh, most uh, I think important issues that you have to take into account. And also, uh, if you go into detail, I mean, KFTC uh, regulation, then the, there is a presidential decree, and uh, uh, you know the, the control is defined the first time I mean, as uh, if, if, if you have a thirty percent voting rights, then uh, you are. Uh, define as a controlling shareholder. However, even if uh, the, you don't have uh, the, have you don't have uh, thirty percent voting rights, uh, still you can be considered as a controller uh, as long as KFTC uh, believes that you are a controlling shareholder. So, for example, uh, the, the, even if uh, you have a three three point seven four percent, I mean, uh, the, well, the can I mention some specific company or uh, the best neighbor? And uh, the, then uh, the, the controlling, uh, the so-called controlling shareholder, I'm not sure whether he's a controlling shareholder. However, according to the KFTC, he is considered as a controlling shareholder, even if uh, he had 3.7%. And so uh, the, the, that is uh, the, another step. And so the, we have a so-called uh, qualitative uh, the, you know, the, uh, standard and also a quantitative standard, 30% low, at the same time qualitative, qualitative standard. And uh, you mentioned the loops and the uh, circular shareholding, right? And uh, the, uh, I also, in my uh, the course, I, I, I tried to calculate it, you know, the, uh, the show uh, my calculation to my students, I mean, uh, the, 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 by, based on the geometric uh, sequence, I mean, in Korean, the and uh, so, uh, but uh, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, three company model is uh, very simple, uh, the, uh, the simplest form, right? And so you have, uh, I mean, imagine how how many the subsidiaries in Korea. And, uh, sometimes 100. Uh, that that is only domestic uh, the legal entities. And if you take into account foreign entities and uh, a lot, 200, uh, for example, then uh, the, you have uh, uh, not only one loop. I mean, a lot of uh, loops. And uh, uh, loops are connected. Then the, the connected loops connected and the, the pyramid structure connected. Then. It's, uh, I mean, in theory, uh, we can use a uh, geometric uh, sequence. However, it's uh, quite difficult uh, in reality, as, as uh, the Professor Kim mentioned, I mean, uh, in reality, uh, uh, you know, I mean, three company model is uh, simple. However, it's uh, quite uh, difficult uh, to uh, use uh, the, such kind of uh, the, the, you know, calculation in the... Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting, but yeah, we, we sure. want to have yeah. the yeah. 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 Okay. A uh, couple of questions. One, uh, first one is, uh, would do the controlling shareholders kind of know this and in advance kind of increase their holdings in uh, in the higher up companies and decrease their uh, decrease their shares in the so like they go to the extremes because they kind of know that people are going to be happy when they see the one and unhappy when they see the other. That's one thing. Uh, second question is, was there any talk about just doing this by disclosure? So rather than saying you have to do this, just say every, you need to tell me, you know, cash flow and voting rights of all your publicly traded uh, members of the group and just stop there. And however, you want to have the latte structure, you know, go for it so long as uh, people can figure out what uh, so I was wondering what, how you interpret your positive coefficient for those firms where the incentives of the controlling shareholder are, are good. So is it because uncertainty is a way for the minority shareholders and they have now more information, or is it really that they now understand that they will actually benefit from exploiting the minority shareholders of the firms lower down in the pyramid? So this, this I think, would be quite essential to, to, to understand if it's really transparency or is it just... <coughs> 
that you're aware now that you can benefit like the controlling shareholder from exploiting others? Uh, just really quickly, um, on, on measurements of, of uh, transition from opacity to transparency, you know, these ownership diagrams, so whether, whether it's loops or a pyramid, these are all directed graphs. There are ways to measure various types of centrality in directed graphs. I would have thought that the natural way to do this was to use, would be to use, I don't know, eigenvalue or page rank centrality or something like that as a proxy for opacity. I, I noticed like a couple of your tables seem to control for it. I don't know which type and I don't know how it relates to some of these other things, but it, on some level that would have been a, a, a less opaque way to measure opacity um, from, from my perspective. Yeah, my last uh, comment as an uh, as I regularly advise to the Korean government on this issue, um, I think the strong incentive came from the uh, public offices because they need to draw all this complicated diagram, which is a pain. <laughs> and uh, secondly, um, in the early 2000s, we saw that the pyramid ownership is much better than the circular ownership. But after 2010, nobody thinks it's like that, as uh, Professor Kim mentioned. So, but your sample came from 2011 to 2018 when the emotion about the pyramid ownership has already uh, deteriorated itself. So thank you. Thank you very much. I guess, so I have uh, like a couple of minutes. I'll, I'll do it in reverse, I suppose. Um, I want to make it clear. I, I, I don't want our paper to be like, uh, we're not making claims about whether or not the regulation is good or bad or the optimality or pyramid. All we're interested in understanding is if you allow people to better observe control and incentives, what happens to value, and it's ambiguous anyways. Um, on this measurement point, yeah, I, I, is your idea, Eric, that basically if you figure out there's more arrow go, arrows going into the company, that's probably that's more, yeah, 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 I, yeah. fair. Um, we, can, we can try that. Uh, that's, that seems sensible. There was a question earlier about is this transparency or is it really about people better understanding uh, the incentives of controllers. Actually, that is what we're calling transparency, but there could be another transparency effect which could be hovering in the background, which is that because you can better see what's going on, there might be potentially better monitoring. And what that could, would do is, again, it would, um, it would enhance that first channel. It would push every, everything upwards in terms of the value effect. What that would mean is that it makes it harder for us to find a negative or a no result, basically. Um, I don't know if that's, that's what you had in mind. Um, in terms of the oh, disclosures, um, that's a really interesting one. My sense was that um, um, firms get strategically placed into opaque positions precisely to make it hard to see what the heck is going on. And so I don't know that um, controllers would have strong incentives to force disclosures to then you know, direct people to, to look around, um, at least in, you know, in that front KFTC said. Yeah, so maybe KFTC should have said it, and you know, rely on the, the Korean scholars here to, to, to teach us. Um, thank you all for your comments. I'm happy to chat more offline. Thanks to the organizers. And this is joint work with Marcel and Raim. Uh, okay, all start. Maybe we can give them on, so it's a dollar. Red one? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there's a broad genre in the corporate governance or the, the law and finance literature that tries to deal with the question what's the effect of X on firm value? Right, and X may be all sorts of things. It may be adopting a classified board structure, it may be adopting a dual, adopting a dual class structure, it may be the filing of 14A proposals by gadflies, it may be this or that regulatory or doctrinal innovation, or a Charlie just uh, tell us about governance transparency, right? Again, broad genre in, in the law finance uh, Historically, people approach this question by focusing essentially on short running events studies. We have some treatment that's introduced. We'll look at how stock price reacts to that. That's fine, or the relatively short window. But more recently, people have instead started to focus more heavily on long run implications through various methodologies. They have looked at the cap performance long run event studies. They have 
performed calendar time portfolio regressions, and uh, to a very uh, increasing extent recently, they have performed Q regressions. So that the core of the, the presentation today will focus on this last bullet. Uh, this, there, there's more to the paper than this, but in a nutshell, the paper is essentially saying that all of the approaches have shortcomings. Uh, but in the case of Q regressions, which we document have become very, very popular over the last 15 years or so, uh, they are just broken beyond repair. For two reasons. One, in within firm designs, so in within firm design, you compare this firm with itself at different points in time after treatment has been introduced or subtracted from the firm. Well, in those cases, you don't need to perform a Q regression. If treatment is being introduced, you can leverage that treatment to simply look at how stock, uh, stock prices react. Uh, well, in those cases, nonetheless, uh, all of the problems that are present with Q, I'm sorry, with, with stock prices, well, they are also present in Q regressions, and there are many more problems at play when you perform Q regressions. So you don't need to lean on them. You have a much better approach, even if that alternative approach uh, has its own shortcomings. In the case of cross-sectional <coughs> regressions, well, in that case, you simply don't have the luxury of having an, a readily available alternative. There's nothing you can, or immediately nothing you can use, at least that we can identify. Uh, but even then, for the very same reasons we discuss as we lead with the discussion of within firm analysis, uh, we would conclude that there's very little you can draw from the cross-sectional regressions. Uh, so bear with me for a few minutes, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So let me start with the decomposition. And this will be the only equation I will show you. So this is our standard definition of Q. It's the market the, the ratio of the ideally market value of equity and market value of debt to the book value of assets. In general, people do not use the market value of debt. They use the book value of debt for reasons of ease and particularly. Uh, this is an equation that describes the evolution of the book value of assets. Next year's book value of assets is going to be equal to current book value of assets plus the profits that the firm made during period T plus the net value of the capital market transactions that the firm engages in during period T. What are those capital market transactions? Stock issuances, debt issuances, minus outflows, stock buybacks, debt repurchases, uh, and dividends. Next year's sum of equity and debt is going to be the current value, oops, I have a later, yes, the current value of equity multiplied by one plus the return on equity plus the capital market transactions, plus the uh, book value of debt, uh, which, so putting all of this together and performing some of the right manipulations, we recover the equation of motion that I'm interested in, which is this. So the change in Q between T and T plus one is equal to the sum of these three terms. What are these three terms? First, changes in firm equity value. That's the right thing to focus on, right? That's what we really want to focus on. Ideally, we would want to focus on both equity and debt. Uh, that's harder, right? That data is seldom available. So, but this is a close second best, focusing only on, on the returns. Uh, but there's more. What else is there? There are capital market transactions, which note for the typical firm, which has a Q greater than one, uh, tend to weigh down Q. So if you engage in net positive capital market transactions and your Q is positive to begin with, I'm sorry, it's greater than one to begin with, uh, that's going to make your Q set or is variables lower than it was at the beginning of, of the period. Uh, same thing about profits. So if you're profitable, notice that there's a minus in front there, that's going to weigh down your Q. So between T and T plus one, you experience profit. And by realization, I mean both the economic and the accounting sense of the word, right? Both work the same way here. Uh, both tend to weigh down your Q. So at the very least, what this suggests is that people who want to perform Q regressions need to be extremely careful about making things apples to apples. So it's not just a matter of comparing the evolution of Q. If what you're really trying to look is at the effect of some treatment on returns, well, you need to be careful to, that the treatment and control firms are on a sort of even or balanced path in terms of their profitability and the incidence of capital market consumptions. But that's the very least of it. Why? Well, because in general, treatment itself may change that and that. In fact, the longer the run over which you focus, trying to tease out the effect of treatment, uh, the more likely it is that that or that is going to change. I mean, why would firm value change other than because, at least in the long run, we expect this treatment to make the firm more profitable, or we expect that in the long run, this firm will be more or less likely to engage in capital market transactions. There's nothing more, I would say, right? So in the long run, it definitely is the case that these things are going to change 
uh, in response to the introduction of, introduction of some treatment if the introduction of, of treatments actually brings about changes in some value. Why is that troublesome? Well, first of all, because some treatments may change firm value in one direction, or at least equity value in one direction, uh, and Q in the opposite direction. Let me illustrate with a super simple numerical example. Uh, we have a firm here which currently has cash on hand for in, in the amount of $100. Uh, it may invest in a project that will generate 50 bucks in profits in periods one, two, and three. Uh, in that case, instead of having 100, in period one, it will just have that 50, uh, because the, the cost of pursuing the project is 100. Uh, in period two, it will have 100. In period three, it will have uh, 150. Uh, we assume that the replacement value of the project is simply linearly decreasing in the life of the project all the way to zero value at the end of the project. This is a three-year lived project. So the replacement value of the project is going to be $66.67 in year one, 33.33 in year two, zero in year three. Uh, the value of the equity, again, to keep things simple, we assume that there's no discounting. So everyone knows at this point that the firm will invest in this project and that it will have 150 bucks in cash at the end of year three. Well, add the non-discount, the non-discounting assumption, that means that the equity value from the get will, will be 150 bucks. Uh, the asset value will be simply the sum of the cash and the replacement value. In the initial period, it's 100. Then it's 50 plus 66 and 67 for that amount then 133, then all the way to the end to 150, uh, which means that Q, which in this case, given that the firm has no debt, is simply the equity value divided by the asset value, will be 1.5 to begin with, 1.29, 113, 1. Right? Now, let me introduce some kind of governance shock that makes it makes the firm more profitable at the beginning or during period one. So that's going to shift from 50, as it was before, to 60 now. Uh, that now will lead to all sorts of uh, trickle-down effects as highlighted in red there, right? Uh, the value of equity will increase by 6.67%, and that's independent of whether you look at that change over a very short run or whether you look at it over the long run in this extremely simplified scenario. Uh, what will happen with the change in Q? Before, remember, we started with 1.5, then it moved to something else and so forth. So at the very beginning, if you only focus on the very short run, Q will increase. That's life, right? That's what we would want to see. But over the longer run, once the profits from the project start to kick in, Q, the changes in Q that the firm will experience as a result of the interaction of this treatment will be negative. That's not the right thing. So that's the right thing to focus on, not this. Another example. Uh, changes that do not change firm value may bring about all sorts of funky changes in Q. Example, again, start, starting from our baseline, assume that the introduction of some governance treatment causes the payoffs of the project to become more forward moving. So instead of having 50, 50, 50, we now have 90, 30, and 30. Again, given no, no discounting, that's not going to change the value of equity, right? The trickle-down effects of that are simply on the amount of cash that the firm will hold in these two interim periods, the asset value in the interim periods, uh, and then Q. So Q will drop astronomically from, so in the initial period, it will remain 1.5, uh, but it will have dropped by 0.328 between 0 and 1, right? or rather relative to a current factor. Right? So again, we had a treatment that had no impact whatsoever on firm value. So firm value remains intact as we front load the cash flow. And yet Q is dropping seemingly off a cliff. Right? We really do not want to be chasing this red right? Uh, isn't there a fix to these problems? Well, the answer is you're barking, barking at the wrong tree. Right? In, in, uh, within firm scenarios, you don't need the fix. Why don't you need the fix? Again, the very assumption of a within firm regression is treatment is changing within firms. Some firms are being are becoming more transparent. Right? To give the, the example that Charlie worked with. Uh, so that means that you can use the other approaches, given size. Short run, long run, again, none of those are perfect, but any of the problems that feature in those alternative approaches, they are also there slightly more, less opaquely, uh, I'm sorry, more opaquely in the case of Q, right? But they are very much there and probably even more seriously. Why? Well, because what are the problems? Risk adjustment is a key problem, right? We don't simply care about increases in firm value. We care mostly about risk adjusted increases in firm value, right? Uh, which leads us, of course, to the uh, omnipresent joint hypothesis problem in, in given studies. Uh, we care about getting statistical inference right. That's an issue in event studies and in calendar time portfolio regression. It's even more of an issue, although people don't realize. 
with your impressions. Uh, attrition. Attrition is a huge deal that nobody ever pays attention to. But of course, the longer the run over which you focus, well, the more serious uh, the concern that attrition will marry the worse. Uh, state contingency. I may have time over joining to speak about that. Uh, one quick footnote to all of this. All of the problems we, we discuss in the paper we go beyond the fact that uh, we are not using um, a sort of platonic idea of Tobin's skill. This is not about measuring things in a more or less precise way. The whole thing should be ditched, not just measured more precisely. Uh, what about the cross-sectional setting? Uh, in that case, as I say, you don't have the luxury of time varying uh, uh, treatment within firm. Uh, but think about the nature of the exercise you perform when you conduct a cross-sectional skill regression. What you have is some treatment firm, some control firm, and the assumption of the exercise when you think for a minute about what you're doing is that at some, I don't know, primeval time, the two firms were comparable, right? And then they forked, and one became treatment, one became control, right? Uh, probably this is, this may be really uh, long before the point at when you're taking that snapshot. Maybe it was the IPO. Maybe some firm opted into this governance structure, standard board, or again, circular structure at the IPO. Maybe the other firm opted into a more transparent structure at the IPO, right? Uh, and this may have happened 30 years before, whatever. And one firm may have gone public 30 years before, whereas the other one public 10 years before. Uh, so the, the immediate first question is, well, well, were the firms really comparable before they decided to fork themselves the way they did? Problem number two is, is the difference in Q that you uh, dissolve at this point, right? You, the firms are comparable at that point, then time elapses, and now Q is very, very different between these two firms. But is that difference driven by the fact that one firm is really more valuable than the other, or is it instead driven by changes in the profitability and the capital market transactions that the companies may have engaged in over the potentially multi-year long period that elapsed between that primeval time and the point when you're taking uh, third, let's assume, let's stipulate that uh, at some point the introduction of the treatment really brought about a drastic change in the returns of the treated firms vis-a-vis -vis the control firms. Well, how likely is it, how possible is it that you will continue to see that effect if you change down Q or you compare Q uh, I mean, 10 years later, as people often do in these long-run Q studies? Uh, so just to give some intuitive idea or some, some uh, suggestive uh, evidence to, to flesh out that answer a little bit from the following exercise. Uh, for each year Y between 2001 and 2010, uh, we identified the US publicly traded firms increased in the top decile of stock returns for the relevant year. Right? Those firms, of course, were highly uh, performed extremely well in terms of the returns. Their average returns, the average returns of those high return firms in year Y, uh, were 173% during the relevant year. Right? If I do a, I separate firms into top decile returns versus the rest, and then I see what the average return of the top decile firms is relative to, uh, to zero at this, at this point out now to a comparison. Well, the top decile firms, on average, across all of those years, uh, they performed, they, they did experience 172% returns in the relevant year. Uh, compared to a measly or a much lower 4.5% return among the, the remaining set of firms. Uh, by the way, I, I should note that this difference in returns is like, I would say, two orders of magnitude larger than the effect that most of the governance treatments that we people in the room tend to study, right? Well, now what I will do is I will follow this, the, the key of these two sets of firms in event, in event time over a decade. So for each year, y, y plus one, y plus two, all the way to y plus, y plus nine, we compare the two groups of firms that we bucketed on the basis of how they performed in the baseline year. And this is how things look, and look like in terms of Q. Of course, during the year when I back at the firms in the two groups, the Q of the treatment firms, right, these firms that experience returns in the top 10 decile, uh, those are way higher, almost one unit higher than the firms in the control group, right, and the remaining nine deciles of firms. But as time elapses, when we get to year five, the two sets of firms are totally indistinguishable from one another. So even in this case where uh, there was some treatment of sorts that triggered that dramatic response in stock prices, which instead, in turn, uh, yielded a, a drastic uh, improvement in, relative improvement in Q. Well, by year five, there's nothing left of it, right? Again, the initial shock is, I would say, two orders of magnitude bigger than the shock that typically comes along when some governance treatment is introduced. 
Uh, why do people use two regressions? Uh, so we tell a story in the paper. And, and the story is, look, historically, Q was probably in a setting where I would be more forgiving about Q regressions, right? Settings where people were trying to compare things cross-sectionally. Right? And, and some extremely influential and very, very, very well-cited papers like top scholars in, in the field have been uh, of this nature. Over time, people started running uh, within firm Q regressions as a sort of back of the, uh, so at the back of the paper in a sort of robustness test. And then I guess that the credibility revolution kicked in, and people realized that cross-sectional regressions do not teach us much because of all sorts of heterogeneity concerns. So they started focusing on time-varying treatment within firm. Uh, at that point, I guess people lost sight of the fact that once you have time-varying treatment within firm, you no longer need to. Like they simply forged ahead. They switch from a cross-sectional specification to a within firm specification, and they never look back. Now, why did they never look back? Well, the answer is, so or at least the snarky answer we got from one of our senior finance colleagues, I don't know, you, you can imagine who that is, uh, is, well, because they work. Well, what does it mean that they work, right? What they mean is that people who run field regressions get away with doing a million things that people who, that people would not be able to get away with if they instead simply run some sort of event set. What kind of things do they get away with? Not thinking about who the control group is, not thinking about what asset pricing model you need to use to compute the normal returns, not thinking about the length of the event window in any conscious way anyway, not probing statistical inference. So all of these things, there's a very well-established playbook that you need to abide by when you run an event study, right? Uh, and people will throw the playbook at you if you do not follow it. When you run pure regressions, for the most part, people do not throw that playbook at you. So these things pass along. I don't want to be overly critical of folks running pure regressions because I, I don't think they are like mischievously rubbing their hands and saying, wow, ha, 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 ha. I'm going to fool everyone by running this. You don't think about it. Right? You simply, if this is a major thing, I want to estimate the effect of X on firm value. What do I do? Well, like Morse like or Vishni or blah, 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 uh, we conduct a pure regression. Right? And you don't think for a second about it. That's a problem. Right? It's not morally. Recyclable, I would say, uh, but it's something that we need to pay a little bit more attention to, right? Uh, it's natural not to argue with something. You get away with it, you don't think about it for, for just a second. Uh, so, main takeaways, just to quote uh, Nancy Reagan for those Americans about 50 in the room, if somebody offers you Q, just say no. Right? What that means is stop running your regressions, right? And stop interpreting your regressions as if they offer you any evidence about the effect of treatment on firm value. Two, uh, well, to the extent that when we perform a backward looking exercise, there are many papers out there that, that try purport to teach us anything about the implications or the impact of this or that governance intervention on firm value. Well, to the extent that they are purely based on pure regressions, well, you should be highly skeptical of that. Results that they are preferring us to preferring to teach us about. Uh, even in the best design studies, right, people who focus on, on the other methodologies that I didn't speak much about today, well, some of the shortcomings we discussed suggest that one should more broadly adopt a skeptical sense. Uh, finally, what we need to realize once we take this perspective is that whenever we introduce some kind of treatment, we are doing two things. We are doing what we think we are doing in terms of the outcome, and we are also generating information about the actual impact of this treatment on firm value. Right? For some uh, agents making changes, it will be irrelevant. If I'm the board of a firm, I probably don't care about this all that much. But from the perspective of regulators or judges, right, this may be more relevant. Why is it relevant? Well, because when you realize that what you're doing is not one thing but two, well, you try to weigh the two purposes you are considering. How you may weigh the two purposes? Well, when I realize, for instance, as a regulator, that this regulation will generate information, well, I make sure that I fine-tune the way in which I'm introducing the, reg the regulation in a way that will more effectively generate that information. For instance, by uh, introducing treatment in a randomized way or in a staggered way or by taking advantage of federalism. Right? So that's all I have and I look forward to it. Thank you. Well, um, thanks again for the, the argument. It's, it's great to be back in, in person and doing this, um, this event. Uh, I'm going to discuss a different paper, the one I read, but uh, but I, you know, um, this is um, I do not disagree with the punchline of the paper, so 
think about this as what else is in the paper? <laughs> what else were, would you read if you had to look at the paper? So I, you know, just generally agree with the healthy skepticism and or maybe the very uh, sharp conclusion here. But there's alternatives, and I'll actually talk about the alternatives as we go. Um, the first question I had was, who's the paper's audience? So who, who is this being addressed to? And uh, is this, as, as um, Emiliano started, is this about governance, or could this be about something, you know, some other uh, policy? So if it is um, about, um, about Q, uh, there, you know, we, we have, you know, raised other issues about Q in the past. So if it is about Q, then I would, I would still, you know, go back and, and see what, what issues have been picked up in the, in the past. And um, mostly measurement error issues, which is what um, Emiliano says that, you know, there's no, no point trying to uh, try to resolve this issue. But um, it's whether you're using average Q or marginal Q, are you using, um, you know, um, correcting for, for other known problems. Are you, in the, in the course of this, are you trying to help academics or are you trying to help beyond academics? Is this, is this paper? Um, and then finally, as I said, is it about just purely corporate governance or is the scope of this um, go beyond that? The second part is, you know, because I was speaking to the paper, the uh, paper was very heavily focused on corporate governance, so um, I thought, well, let's ask around the room, like, well, how would you guys define corporate governance to know what, whether we, we should be assessing it or not? And, I, you know, I, I hear a lot about Delaware, 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 from, uh, but, you know, um, Elizabeth and others have said, you know, that I think um, previous ECGI events have talked about not just Delaware, Congress, SEC, this is really rolling out throughout the, the institutions, like investors, property advisors, stock exchanges, and, and all. This is a very pervasive um, form. Um, and to the point that, you know, when I was reading through, scrambling through the paper myself, and uh, this tells you I don't read very many law papers, um, the first five pages have 28 footnotes, <laughs> which, means, which means all these things are corporate governance, or have been labeled corporate governance be before. And, uh, you know, what's connecting all these things? Um, you know, what's really important? So I went back to my field, and uh, not that we have a better sense, but the, the sense of corporate governance I had, um, you know, walking into this field was this is about the financiers or the suppliers of capital uh, getting their money back. That's sort of what, what assures you that you are financing this enterprise and you're getting a fair return on it. And that would probably bring us all the way back to Adam Smith, you know, not just the separation of ownership and control, but just the, the whole creation of limited liability corporations and so forth. Um, empirically, what uh, my, my colleagues would have done is, you know, they started with like a, a kitchen list of uh, governance provisions, the 24 provisions of the G index, which you guys helped sort out a little bit when enter uh, the so-called entrenchment index, which then, you know, folks like Charlie and others have said, well, that the market has learned about them. So as, you know, this evolves, what we define as corporate governance may not be so relevant in the second period. There's no excess return or offers from those. And I'm not the only one doing this, but many others are summarized this. And then finally, maybe this is that this paper is not about not for lawyers or, or law scholars, not for finance, but just broadly for the public. And there luckily we still have folks from GPIF and APG and so forth in the room. Um, so what is it that these folks call governance? Um, so I was trying to summarize this for a CFA Institute um, review, and I, you know, shareholder rights, composition of boards, management, they considered many other things that go beyond what I considered, like fraud and bribery and so forth. The, 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 the word governance, for, for, from that perspective, is a, a lot broader. And there's a, lot, a large dispersion right there, right, when you go in the marketplace and you try to measure these things, um, and you take different uh, data providers. 
And question what works in terms of whether we're reaching MSCI is going to become the dominant way to measure these things or not. So this is in a, just, you know, as, as I went through this, I had the first question, what, who's the audience? Number two, is this about governance? How would I define governance? Number three, would this only be about US style governance, which, you know, we're here in Korea for the GCGC. And, you know, when I attempted to build similar indices um, uh, for, for other countries, we took 41 dimensions uh, from ISS, uh, or for example, when Wushan uh, did it in Korea, you know, we took very country-specific dimensions of governance that might matter here, but not in Turkey, not in Brazil, whatever. Um, so maybe this has to be, so maybe there's not no one size fits all, and it all depends on what is the, the main form of conflict that exists here. Is this the management, the shareholder, um, you know, separation of ownership control there in the U.S., or is it between, like as Charles was mentioning today, between minority and, and controlling shareholders? What other country factors should I? Um, many, many governance mechanisms get used, the, the one we just heard about, like pyramid structures and, and so forth, but there are other control enha enhancing mechanisms out there. Mark and others have, um, have, can give you views over that. And then finally, uh, is it only about equity? And that, you know, I'm a finance professor, I don't disagree with that, you know, bringing that angle first to the conversation, but I'm also in a business school. And that doesn't stop in, in equity. Um, so what, what happens when there's other securities, you know, equities, other sector providers, and also, you know, uh, beyond suppliers of capital? And then finally, the, the question I asked myself, even before I went and read, uh, the, the, is who's, you know, is, is the market learning as we speak? So as we have more studies and so forth, what's happening? So, um, Emiliano did not share with you, but uh, they were trying to compile an appendix, a table of which, how many papers have there existed since 2012, uh, in, um, that have used event study, uh, returns, calendar time, portfolio returns, and um, some infused, which work in progress. I would say just at this day and age, you sh I, I would have loved to see a meta-analysis of how, how, if you were to tabulate this over time, what methods have been used you, and you can limit yourself to the top three, um, but it would be great to see when what results are, are being reported uh, in, in published, or just ask AI to do that further, and uh, you know, uh, that might be helpful. All right, so with all that, now I'm going to actually talk about the paper. Um, the, the, they spent quite some time also on the events, um, on the short-term uh, event studies, and um, what are the issues you run into that? Um, so as an alternative to Q, if we ditch Q, and we, we actually uh, go back to uh, short-term event studies, the problem is, as, as they properly um, present in the paper, you, the market reaction is not the value creation or reduction, it's the market's updating that occurred because of this, this event. That's the first thing. The second thing they highlight is that it's, um, we are typically, you know, equal weighting observations as if they all matter the same. And, uh, you know, maybe they wouldn't all matter the same if we value weight. And then finally, uh, we're just looking at the shareholder returns because we failed to receive, to have um, updated data on the, the other situation. Man, the other, sorry, there's several uh, challenges I would say here that go beyond that is there's a clustering of events. Maybe a lot of this reform goal or this adoptions of these governance provisions, or they all happen quite, you know, around the same time. That introduces another layer of problem. Um, or maybe there's even if you're trying to evaluate, some things happened 20 years ago and some things are happening now. So you actually have a time value of, of money in the um, to do that. Or it might have affected beyond equities, as I mentioned. You know, you might have multiple share classes. You might have preferred or that, and you're going beyond capital providers if you also are, are taking a, a larger um, perspective on this thing. So I just, you know, just highlight, and I think the paper is, is quite instructive on that. But there might be a few more dimensions that that can be added to flesh out what, you know, what what other issues you may run 
if you choose to uh, just focus on event studies. And then, uh, if I go next to that, the next alternative is to go beyond short-term event studies, but to work a long-term calendar time for quality returns. So I'm actually presenting the Emilianus paper for you right now, because this, this is all in the paper, but I think you should read the paper also you know, on, on this dimensions as well. So that one issue that they, they raised was that, and it's an important issue that if you're building portfolios by the end, you'll, you may have less observations than in the beginning because there's exit that can occur through acquisitions, bankruptcy, uh, the listings, and all that. The second is it may be very state contingent. You know, it might have been the results that occurred, uh, you know, when anti takeover, whatever the statues, all these things happened in the 90s the, or in the late 80s to the 90s, and you might have all had only one market setting on which you observe the effects. So it might be very uh, state contingent. Um, lastly, there's issues with rebalancing. How does one rebalance these types of portfolios? As many uh, merger arbitrage or other types of hedge funds have found out, it's not so easy then to take all this, uh, all this um, calendar time portfolio approaches and actually trade on them and actually build portfolios around them. Um, or, or there's the, the, the asset pricing question, which I think is particularly true if you go beyond the US. The, the issue, if you go beyond the US, you may have a very short time. The whole market might be quite young to begin with. You may have a, a limited time set, and you may not have a good asset pricing model. So we, we might have still a challenge to, be, you know, to figure out how do we properly adjust um, for the risk factors, or which risk factors uh, exist. It's not clear that you know, Japan has momentum until maybe foreign shareholders showed up, and there's actually some evidence of that, that the model may not have, not encompass just the market and size and, uh, and you know, the other dimension. So you may have this, this, this last issue. And then finally, if I get to uh, Emiliano's actual <laughs> point about ditching Q, uh, which uh, naturally, I think he talked about, you know, the first two points a lot, and, um, how it, it uh, might be affected by the event itself, how we, you know, we should take into account through profitability, but also might affect the uh, capital market transactions. And I do not disagree with the math. I, I think that's right. So naturally, it would have, um, uh, you know, a reversion to the mean or some sort of like um, counter into, um, some somewhat counterintuitive effects and, or, or just meaningless effects just from the, the pure um, you know, um, equations. Um, what I would say is, I would, I would also highlight another thing about Q these days. Oh, I still have a lot of that. <laughs> I, I would say uh, that's still a, a big thing in my mind. Someone just ran a Q regression. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for installing that on our phone. Emiliano, I appreciate it. <laughs> so um, we're not hovering around one anymore. This um, this may be if you get a chance to talk to accounting colleagues and you know they're just not law scholars and finance uh, academics working on this. But if you go across to other departments, I would just highlight that as of as we speak, most queues or market to books. You know, it, I don't think about queues as very different from market to books. But, as uh, practitioners use, um, they're just way out there. This is a, a different economy we're living in compared to the old economy. It's a, it's a matter that a lot of the uh, assets are more intangible and they're not as well picked up by book value or accountants are not doing as much. So actually, the, right before I, I, you know, I Google, what is the market to book ratio for Apple? And it's, it's north of 20, you know. It's like there's no, that's, you know, there are very many co companies out there in the, in the public markets, particularly in the US, where this is completely off the chart. So then if, you, if we're you know, um, using it, that, that's another. I, I would highlight that issue as well. So do a meta-analysis of how this has been used, but also show us some data uh, on, on average accused and, and so forth. And then um, you know, do, do not disagree. With, with the, the, the big punchline, I, I actually want to hear others' thoughts on, like, is there a way to, you know, resurrect 
queue for, for Charlie, for myself, and others. <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Uh, <laughs> but thanks, Emiliano, for writing the paper. And again, recommend that you guys read Beyond uh, what was presented by Emiliano today. Well, first, thank you, Pedro, for a very generous discussion. You, I don't envy your position of having to discuss a paper that was in such a fluid shape. Uh, so I very much appreciate what you have to say. Uh, grappling with some of your questions. First, who's the intended audience? I would say there are three audiences we are aiming this paper at. One is our uh, corporate colleagues who are consumers, not producers, of this kind of literature. Uh, this paper arose as a result of many post-seminar discussions where Marcel and I went back and forth about our personal pet peeves in connections with papers that we had seen presented. Uh, so that somewhat, is somewhat reflected in the fluid shape in which the paper still is. Uh, many of our colleagues are definitely not uh, fluid conversants in this literature, and I think they would benefit from uh, having someone hold their hand and enable them to see exactly what can and what cannot be uh, taken out of from the use of this versus that methodology. Second set of people we, uh, we would care to, to reach out to is uh, referees. So at the beginning when we started thinking about the project, we were skeptical that uh, our focus on Q, for instance, would have a lot of traction, and then we started digging up digging up some papers, and we discovered that, well, it, it turns out that there are lots of papers that are engaging in this, in this kind of capital C, the way we, uh, we look at things. Uh, and that's what gave us some uh, thrust to, to continue forward. I mean, I myself have been uh, probably too flexible with papers I've refereed that use this as their main workers methodology, and I have simply given them an easy task. Nowadays, if a similar paper landed on my desk, I would be much tougher. Right, and I know many people in this room are in the business of writing dozens of referee reports a year. Uh, given that you're here, I suspect that sooner rather than later, you'll be dealing with a paper that focuses on the impact of X on firm value, and that, unfortunately, you'll run into tables three, four, and five after the restricted stats, reporting various Q regressions. Uh, well, now you know what to do. The, the third intended audience is a very minuscule group of editors. They are really the ones who are uh, at the switch, uh, they should be way more attentive than they have been over the last 15 years at making sure that these things do not pass the filter. Pedro, uh, yes, is it just about governance? And I agree, so Marcel and I are governance scholars at heart, so we approach this from a governance perspective, but uh, we could very much ditch the corporate governance part of the title and, and keep the more minimalist firm value and see how that fares, because indeed, uh, all of the things we discuss are not necessarily only focused on governance, although on the other hand, going, now moving on to your, uh, your next question, how do we define governance? Uh, I would say, I will not speak to, for, for myself, for Marcel, I'm sorry, but from my own perspective, I have a very broad definition of governance, uh, which is consistent with the one you uh, quoted from Schleifer and Bishke, for instance. It's this multi-purpose set of mechanisms that ensures that people will get a return on their investment, and from that perspective, this can encompass things as as uh, varied as, I don't know, financial regulation, uh, accounting standards. All of those things help people make sure that their money uh, is returned to them. So once we broaden the definition of governance sufficiently, I guess, we could keep the corporate governance part of the title, but we might as well drop it and again, keep a more minimalist firm value thing. Thank you. I, I also don't disagree with the, the punchline, although I am skeptical about your ability to um, influence the cabal of uh, Q regression runners absent, I don't know, uh, negotiation with Stata or our producers to get the alarm going when they try. Yeah, I mean, look, we as accountants known about the measurement issues in Q or market to book for years and years, right? Gap forces us to expense certain things that we think of as being investments. But I think the modal reviewer, if you like the results, you give them a pass. If you don't like it, here's like a menu of 15 things um, that you can complain about to, to reject the paper. So I, I'm somewhat, my sense is maybe there's going to be some um, linguistic changes. People are going to say, we're not looking at firm value. We're going to study market valuation multiples. Practitioners give out multiples, that's a real thing. I'd imagine they would do that. 
uh, and try and get away with it. I wonder if you can maybe offer other kinds of advice about how you can, if you really want to run these queue regressions, make them more compelling. Um, one way might be, you know, there's a famous well-known decomposition of market to book, which is it's excess profitability, like ROA and ex excess of WAC capitalized divided by, you know, discount rate minus the gro growth rate. So show what's happening. If you want to run these long-term regressions at firm level, just show what hap what's happening with profitability or cash flows, what's happening with growth, and you know, there's some discount rate measures you can look at, what's happening to beta. And if the results conform, you know, maybe you're less worried. Um, that might be one way to address the, the, the fall. I think I'm getting old, but, but I spent a lot of time doing a Q regression 30 years ago. And, uh, but the Q regressions we used to do uh, were different from the Q regression you talked about here. Uh, what in two important reasons, I guess. And that's where the literature evolved, and uh, probably in a wrong way from uh, this type of, if you want to learn something about the long term impact of from balance. The one difference is uh, in your Q regression, you, or in, in the Q regression you criticize, you have Q on left hand side of the regression. We used to have, I, I, I worked on the Q regression where Q is on the right hand side and try to in, 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 uh, explain the investment. And in that literature which came out of macro, in the long run, after the adjustment of the investment to the Q, that at least the marginal Q goes to one or one plus delta, which is a depreciation rate. So um, it's, uh, it's, from that point of view, it doesn't make sense to put Q on the left-hand side, especially if you want to look at something in the long run. And another thing that changed uh, since then is that you said the Q regression is extremely easy. Uh, it wasn't the case back then because we were careful talking about the tax, sweet tax correction of the replacement value and things like that. And I just didn't use uh, something very much similar to the price to ratio. So we, did, we, we have to do a lot of things to calculate uh, something close to marginal Q. So I, I think that, that, that those, those were the two things that changed in the literature and uh, that, that made a Q regression, or most of the Q regressions today not, not make any sense. Uh, and and uh, I, I have a comment on the last picture of the discussion show that the Q is increasing. And I, I think that uh, one explanation of that is that that looks at the average Q. And uh, what, uh, what we know about the long run level is the marginal Q, and that goes to close to one. But the average Q can be different from one even in the long, long run if there's a monopoly power. And also the tax situation is different. So one possibility is that we are seeing a lot of more, more monopoly, which makes the average queue much higher than the marginal queue. So that's uh, something we need to uh, we need to take into account. Uh, Emiliano, I want to ask you a question <laughs> about classical philosophy. Um, it's actually a decision theory question, but since you talked about the Platonic ideal, I'll, I'll put it in those terms. So I want to, uh, you to imagine you are the prisoner chained up, chained up in uh, Plato's cave, and, uh, and you are looking at a shadow cast on the wall given some technology about some form you cannot see, let's call it firm value, um, or increase in firm value. And, and there's this kind of, I don't know, distorted, noisy shadow cast on the wall. It's not a perfect representation. Uh, and you have another one that's uh, like on a slightly different wall from a different angle. It's way noisier and it's way more distorted, all right? And so the question is, should you use that second one at all, right? Does it, is it, if you're trying to figure out what the true shape looks like, should you only look at the one that's less noisy and less distorted, or should you use both of them? All right, and I think the answer to this is you should use both of them, even the really noisy one, if it embeds any independent information from the first one. And so I wanna push you a little bit on that because I think on, on some level, 
I think you were trying to say, no, there's no new information in Q regressions. But then some of the decomposition that you gave us seems to have other information that wouldn't be in a returns regression. So I'd be interested in whether a, an alternative phrasing of your thesis is we should just put way less weight on Q regressions rather than just say no to Q. So we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, when we talk about uh, your decomposition. Uh, later on, you say that you know average Q, marginal Q, that's like a measurement issue. Uh, but I can imagine that if you, uh, I would like to see the decomposition for uh, for marginal Q, uh, and I'm I, 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 I'm not sure that it's only a measurement issue. Uh, it may be that some of these other issues uh, get better. Some of the like these weird properties. May get better uh, with marginal, with marginal. Not sure, but I think it's worth checking. Okay, no more questions? Thanks, guys, for the questions. These are super helpful. So, Charlie, so one thing you have now that may help you influence it, or may help all of us collectively influence it, about, about we'll have a paper that will stick in your back. The moment you get the referee report request, and you see that the second table is about you, you immediately say, read this paper, you shouldn't do that. It's a one-stop shop. Uh, so I, I should be perhaps more pedantic in terms of dealing with the Q regressions. We focus on one particular flavor of Q regressions. Q, Q can be used for other ends, and we have nothing to say as to that. Right? People have, been used, have, have used Q, for instance, to measure the extent to which firms have uh, investment opportunities that they cannot fully invest in because they are cash constrained or something like that. Totally separate question. You may use Q to that end. Uh, you may use Q on the right hand side for the purposes you discussed. Uh, our focus is on Q regressions where Q is put on the left hand side, typically of the final regression, for the sake of uh, assessing whether this or that type of treatment affects firm value. Uh, as to Eric, uh, agree if, if Q, so if the data generating process was there's some underlying information that we cannot see, and then we can get two signals, each of which involves some independent shock, uh, then we would want to use Q. We would want to use a second signal. But my sense is, the way the dynamic plays out is, we have some underlying thing that we cannot see. We see stock returns, and then we further garble that to Q. Right? Uh, that's not going to shed any additional bit of information. It's only going to be garbage in, garbage out. It's going to only give us more garbling. So I embrace the idea of putting less weight on Q. I just take it to the limit. Put zero weight on those Q regressions.